Well, welcome everyone to our online discussion about financing affordable housing development. My name is Becky Gray and I serve Chafee County as the Director of Housing. And today I will be your host. This event is a continuation of the Housing and Health Speaker Series that occurred over the last year. And it's the first of four events designed specifically for our planning commissions and elected officials in Chafee County. And I'm so glad to see you joining the conversation this afternoon. The Housing and Health Speaker Series is funded through the Colorado's Health Disparities Grant Program. It is being administered jointly by the Office of Housing and the Department of Public Health in Chafee County. There are many linkages between housing stability and the health of our community. And this program is intended in part to highlight those connections. I would like to offer public gratitude to Andrea Karlstrom, Lisa Martin, Heather Gorby, Dale Shoemaker, and Janie Hayes, all of who make up the housing and health team and have been instrumental in the execution of these events. Thank you so much, team. If you have not yet checked out the housing and health website, please do. You will find recordings of past speaker series events, links to upcoming events, video stories of Chafee County residents and their experience with housing insecurity, a housing 101 booklet full of definitions and acronyms, as well as information on advocacy efforts and how you can participate. The website is www.housinghealthchafee.org. We are once again grateful to have this Zoom platform to host today's discussions. For those of you who have not yet become expert at Zooming over the last six months, I want to point out that as an audience member, you're all muted, which simply means that if you talk, we can't hear you. However, there is a Q&A feature on Zoom. So if you have questions now or during the presentation, you can ask them by clicking on Q&A in the center of the bottom of your screen, type in your message and hit enter, and the questions will come to me. Once our panelists have finished their presentations, I'll ask the questions on your behalf. So jump on in the discussion and ask away. Another Zoom feature that we'll be using today is real-time polling. You should be seeing some questions pop up on your screen. Let me start the poll. And it looks like we have a limited audience. So Mr. Uh, Joel Benson, who's joining us this afternoon, you're welcome to start um, selecting the poll um, answers. What we're doing with this data is um, collecting it to analyze, one, our audience participation, and then two, your opinions about how we can use this information to inform policy recommendations and planning efforts. Your, um, your answers are anonymous and they are largely um, going to be rolled into a grant report that will be submitted at the end of this experience. And in appreciation for your participation today, you're eligible to receive a Chafee County Discovery Pass, which will save you nearly $600 on eats, drinks, shops, and adventures here in our wonderful community. So if you'd like to receive the Discovery Pass, please put your email into the Q&A feature anytime during the event and the housing and health team we'll get that discovery pass to you right away. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that polling and we will then jump right in to introductions for the main event. So I have invited two Coloradans to join us today, both of whom are experts in the field of financing affordable housing developments. Catherine Grosscup and Chris Furlong. They will share an overview of finance development and explain the intricacies of using the state finance tools available to us. Following their presentations, we will launch the question and answer session and be joined by our community relationship manager from the Colorado Housing Finance Authority who is based in the San Luis Valley, Mr. Jeff Owsley. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce to you Catherine Grosskamp, 
who just this week we learned is now serving as the tax credit manager for the Colorado Housing Finance Authority, otherwise known as CHAFA. Catherine previously served as a senior tax credit officer at CHAFA for two years, assisting with the allocation of tax credits and providing expertise to developers, local governments, nonprofits, and housing authorities. Prior to joining CHAFA, Catherine garnered more than 20 years of experience in affordable housing with the Colorado Department of Local Affairs, Division of Housing, Garfield County Housing Authority, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Catherine, congratulations on your new appointment and welcome to virtual Chafee County. The screen is all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Becky. That was a great introduction. I'm very happy to be here. So um, are you ready for me to take it away, I think, with my presentation? Yes, ma'am, you can take it away. You can start sharing your screen and we look forward to hearing all that you have to say. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and run through about 30 minutes of conversation. Let's see if I can do this successfully. It should be sharing, is that accurate? Yes, ma'am, it looks good. Okay. Um, let me just orient since it's, okay. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about um, affordable housing and um, sort of how we conceive of that and talk about it and then move into a conversation about housing tax credits, which are one of the largest vehicles for constructing and making affordable housing happen um, nationwide and here in Colorado. First, I wanna do a, a quick um, discussion of CHAFA, Colorado's Housing and Finance Authority. So we are a 40 year old uh, plus organization that is chartered through the state legislature, but we're not uh, an arm of government. We're a standalone nonprofit mission based. We have three areas that we work in, um, financing home ownership for first time and other um, homeowners working on affordable rental housing, not only through the allocation of housing credits, but also uh, multifamily lending. And then we also work in business finance, um, doing a small business lending and other capacity building. So we have three lines of business. I wanna spend a second on um, how we see the housing continuum in Colorado. Um, CHAFA works in all of these spaces, but you, we break down when we talk about housing into a variety of, of categories along a spectrum, uh, ranging from homelessness all the way to long-term stable home ownership. Um, and we have a variety of programs um, that work on these different stages uh, or vulnerability aspects of housing. Um, I'm gonna be spending time on that sort of yellow band in the middle or green yellow. Um, housing credits, which um, really do serve quite a lot of this spectrum, which is part of why they are very effective. I do want to spend a second on how generally affordable housing is defined. So generally, there's been um, agreement over the decades, starting with HUD and all other agencies, that one way to talk about how uh, housing can be affordable is to talk about spending no more than 30% of your gross income on housing costs. And so that would be a conversation of combining rent and utilities at all bands of income. And to be affordable, you would be spending no more than 30% of that gross income. But this looks different in different um, contexts. So uh, I don't really know what the one bedroom market rate rent would be in Chafee County. This number might be a hair high or it might not be <laughs> in many areas of our state, this is getting to be the types of rents that we see um, even in one bedroom units. But depending on your income, what is affordable to you varies. So um, we break down and we talk about area median income, which is a metric for understanding affordability. So a household who is at 20% of the area median income might have the ability to afford, afford a rent of in this example, 341. Whereas a household that might be at 80%, earning 80% of the area median income could afford quite a bit more in rent. And in some cases, they don't have to even pay the full amount of 30% of their income if market rents are slightly under that. So hopefully that's illustrative of how 
conversations matter across income, uh, income bands. Chaffa, um, over the years, generally now we're building about 6,000 units a year or funding and financing that number, rental units a year. And uh, several years ago, we commissioned a study to examine what does it cost to build. And this is sort of a generic example, or it's a roll up of all of that work, talking about how the hard costs generally are about 65% of the, the rental unit. You have other costs within, um, in this case, we have some syndication fees because of the credit model, um, other financing costs, site work, land and buildings, uh, insurance and title work, TAP fees from lo local municipalities and other costs. And the reason for this slide is to talk about, um, there are ways to influence costs by potentially working on different aspects, but it's really hard to overall um, come at making something affordable by um, working 100% on the cost side. Often it is the financing tools that really are needed to get to those deeper rents. In general, um, when we talk about how um, rental housing is financed, uh, generally it is about 70% debt from a bank and 30% equity. So a developer or a developer group might have some uh, funds that they can contribute to purchase a, land, a piece of land, deal with entitlement, uh, maybe contribute to some of the site work and other professional fee costs, architects, engineers. And then they will seek um, debt financing from financial institutions to bring the project to fruition. That works great. The challenge in affordable housing is that often you cannot finance the same amount of debt as you could in a market rate project because your rents are intended to be lower or even significantly lower than market rent. So what ends up happening is that you can only command debt for maybe 30% of your need and you have a large gap that you're facing to make this project feasible. Becky, you asked that I talk a little bit about um, sources and uses and um, capital stack financing. What I wanted to do here with this slide is illustrate that ultimately uh, you need balance. If a project is about $17 million in uses between the land, the construction fees, finance costs, other uh, important aspects, you need to have the same amount of sources to get there. And often, because your target is lower rents, you cannot have the same amount of debt. You're requiring soft funders to be involved. And one of the larger vehicles is the housing credit that I'll talk about. So here is an example. I just wanted to give a picture of a tax credit finance project in Crested Butte. This actually is one building. I kind of love it because it looks like multiple buildings with different facades, but it's actually a single skin building just um, creatively designed uh, that uh, is built in core Crested Butte, affordable housing project. The housing credit or the low income housing tax credit um, is a federal vehicle. It's run by the US Treasury or the IRS. Um, and in Colorado, we're fortunate also to have housing um, state credits, housing credits here that are authorized by our state legislature. Housing credits are really the largest source that exists for developing affordable rental housing. It uh, originally was a program created in the mid 80s, uh, authorized uh, in the Reagan era. And so we have about 35 years of experience making this industry very mature and very successful. The concept is that there is a dollar for dollar credit to reduce investors taxes, federal liability taxes or in the state in, in some cases. Those credits are extended over 10 years. Compliance is at least 15 or in many cases 30 or 40 years, but the risk of credit recapture goes for a minimum of 15 years. And then there are two types and we won't be talking about that today but there are two types of federal low-income housing tax credits, 4% and 9%. And the idea is to understand that 4% is less impactful um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the equity that will come to the deal. And so often you cannot do as deep of rents as you can with the 9% credit. In rural markets, often the 
the only way to really get to the goals of um, housing groups is to use the 9% credit. I will talk about how competitive that is. So there's always, um, you know, decisions to be made using these vehicles. In Colorado, um, our legislature recently expanded our housing credits. So we have authorization of 10 million annually, which is leveraged um, in a competitive round. Uh, Chaffa has matched the state AUTEC credit with 4% federal credits. So we try to maximize the use and um, number of units that can be built with this resource. It's slightly different than the math for the federal low-income housing tax credit. It's over a six-year credit period. It has lower pricing. There's just fewer um, investors interested in the state credit because fewer uh, investors have state Colorado state tax liability than nationwide. Nonetheless, it's still very competitive and we've seen a lot of success using this resource uh, in Colorado. The basic idea with housing credits is that it's a public-private partnership. Chaffa's role is to be, in the purple, the allocator of tax credits. So twice a year, we receive um, competitive round applications to um, analyze in a very in-depth process. Generally, the um, subscription is about two to one or three to one for the credits available. We go through a robust pro process to make determinations of award. Um, and once an award is um, received, the developer then will uh, have an allocation of credits that can be sold to investors. So those are the two green arrows where the sale of tax credits results in money or the equity needed to construct the project. Meanwhile, the investor is able to offset their tax liability over the 10 years taking that credit annually. This model works because um, it's a mission-based model where um, developers are then serving um, certain affordable housing um, households, either senior families or other uses. They have a vested interest to make sure that they're complying with that agreement. The investor also is very interested in that success in order to main their, uh, maintain their tax offset. So it uh, involves a lot of compliance, a lot of eyes, long-term commitment, and it also brings together um, mission-based work with um, private sector financial um, expertise and developers. So it really is a great public-private partnership that has been the way to really construct the most affordable housing nationwide. This is another illustration of how um, credit can work to drive down the rents that you can offer to your residents. In conventional rental construction, because you have 70% debt, you're limited at how deep of a subsidy you can, subsid you can bring your rents down to. So generally they'll be close to market or slightly under market. When you're looking at the 4% federal housing credit, maybe combined also with the state credit, if you follow that purple line, you're able to lower your rents, serve more vulnerable families in your communities. It takes more work because you're um, now competing for competitive resources. And then ultimately the 9% credit where you can often get to um, serving homeless members in your community or very vulnerable families um, and seniors really is the most competitive situation but allows you to offer the lowest rents because it will bring the greatest equity to the project. Tax credits work because the developer agrees to long-term affordability. In many cases, um, a minimum of 30 to 40 years to operate the project as proposed. The private sector is assuming the risk. So they are taking the risk to develop the project for success. Um, that competitiveness here in Colorado generates very strong projects. So if we're seeing two to one to three to one potential applications in each of our rounds, Chaffa is very able to analyze and really pick projects that um, are very, very competitive. So we're very fortunate that way. In addition, we're able to customize what's called the qualified allocation plan. So every state has a qualified allocation plan. And in Colorado, um, we have um, customized that to suit our interests um, here. What 
Oh, I think I've got those slides out of order. Sorry about that. So let's first talk about who the players are and then I can describe what Chaffa has as priorities. But in the housing credit mo model, the players um, are the allocation agency. So that would be Chaffa developers. And we work with nonprofits, for-profits, housing authorities, um, and combinations of, of these entities who might join together. Another critical player, of course, is the investor um, who would provide the equity pricing and the equity to construct. Treasury for um, oversight and regulatory guidance, and then other lenders who would be involved in the project. As I mentioned before, our qualified allocation plan is required by, um, by the IRS. Um, and it does have some basic goals, which are serving the lowest for the longest, the lowest rents for the longest period, looking at qualified census tracts, and those are produced annually. You can be look up, but that allows a little bit of a boost. It makes the credit go a little bit farther. And also um, tasking each housing finance agency to only award the minimum amount of credit necessary for financial feasibility. So Chaffa really works hard to um, underwrite and uh, perform good due diligence so that we know we can make this resource go as far as it can. Here in Colorado, um, we have um, some guiding principles as well as priorities in the, color in the qualified allocation plan, really looking at um, a, a fair process for awarding credits considering the maximum amount that can be applied for, ensuring strong geographic distribution of the credit, making sure that we're serving a variety of populations in our, our projects. Um, we've deployed average income or income averaging, which is a newer use of the housing credit, but works very well in um, hot metro markets as well as uh, resort markets that are part of Chaffee County. We have three priorities. Uh, projects serving, serving homeless persons, projects serving persons with special needs, and also projects in counties with populations of less than 180,000 people. So certainly Chafee County automatically is one of um, Chaffa's priorities with the population. So just quickly in the last year in 2019, um, this is a map of how Chaffa allocated housing credits. Um, and the idea is sort of to show that we do truly work very hard to dis distribute the credits statewide. Um, it, the first column is um, where we have our portfolio of awards. And the second is where Colorado's renters reside. And you can see that we've actually done a little bit more work in the metro area, but when it comes to mountain resort, uh, Chaffa is a little ahead also in terms of uh, credit allocation. Um, you know, we're pretty much on balance in most areas of the state trying to match the population to distribution of, of the resource. Another look um, over time, just looking at 20 years of uh, not only housing credit, but sort of the rental situation in our state. Um, so in 2000, Chaffa did about 2,000 units, and we've really been able to um, grow that by three times even now in 2019, so about 6,000 units a year. Uh, our production has grown threefold if you look at about 100 million to 325 million, a little more. Uh, if you can look at the average unit cost, however, 100,000 in 2000 up to near, we're pushing 300,000 now nearly in 2019. So it's gotten more expensive to develop. One of the hard parts about this chart is that of course the average rent has nearly doubled in Colorado. If you look at 2000 where the average rent statewide was about $700, now we're pushing 1500 statewide. So while we've been able to grow our resources and our response, um, other factors are also you know, exacerbating the housing challenge. Um, in Colorado, cost burden renters were about 41% of the population in 2000. Now they're about half of the rental population, 51% in 2019. So again, um, we've been more and more creative, expanding the resource, looking at different ways to respond to this challenge, but the challenge has grown um, you know, even greater than those resources have kept up. 
I want to talk at the end here about a couple tools that Chaffa is working on presently. Um, one is an affordable housing developer guide. So this is a project that we're really excited about. Um, is being led by Caroline Tranny, who could not be here today, but uh, a partner with Jeff Owsley. Um, and this will be a guide, um, a digital as well as published guide coming out next spring, 2021. And the idea here is to really provide a roadmap or a comprehensive guidebook for how you do affordable housing development. So everything from the pre-development phases through even operating and post development. So we think this will be a great tool in a lot of the rural areas of the state um, where there aren't as many, um, there is less capacity and not as many development entities working. So we hope this will be a, a part of helping to um, fill those gaps. In addition, Chaffa is working on a small housing innovation project. We call that SHIP, Small Housing Innovation Project. Again, a 2021 project. And the goal here is to actually make available um, development consultants who would be Chaffa funded, who could be made available in smaller communities to help uh, move projects forward and get to uh, solutions in smaller communities. Part of this work would include pre-development grants that would be necessary maybe for feasibility studies, uh, others, other parts of what is necessary in the pre-development process before uh, actually constructing. And then in another critical part, of course, would be developing financing models for small housing projects. And what we're talking about here would be projects that are 30 units or fewer. So perfect for a lot of areas of Colorado uh, where there are very big housing needs, but you can't construct 100 units. It just wouldn't make sense. And uh, this is a charge being led by Jeff and Caroline, Chaffa's community relationship managers. So they'll be bringing more as those projects unfold. And so Becky, that's what I have today. And I'm happy to take questions, um, I guess, as you direct at the end of all the presentations. Catherine, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I really appreciate your level of detail um, in how the tax credit works. And I'm very excited about the affordable housing guide and the SHIP program. I look very forward to working with Jeff and Caroline on that. We're gonna pause on the questions until after Chris's presentation. And then um, I've been jotting down some of my own. And if any of the attendees that are joining us today have questions, you are welcome to enter them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who joined us a little bit late, you're also eligible for a Chafee County Discovery Pass, which is a discount pass worth over $600 um, at our local restaurants, um, bars, and, and entertainment establishments, as well as some of our adventures. So please feel free to pop into the Q&A, ask a question, and um, give me your email address. I'll make sure you get a discovery pass. So let's transition now and go over to um, speak with our region's housing development specialist, Mr. Chris Furlong. He is with Adola's Division of Housing, where he underwrites gap funding applications and works with regional developers, housing organizations, and municipalities to finance and construct affordable housing, primarily in the central mountains of the state, as well as El Paso and Douglas counties. Chris has a background in affordable housing development and has experience with low-income tax credit finance, um, I'm sorry, with low-income tax credit development, finance, and deal structuring. He began his development career in market rate housing and also spent time as a Fannie and Freddie multifamily lender in the Washington DC area where he grew up. Welcome to the Chafee discussion, Chris. We're glad to have you and uh, the screen is yours. Great, thanks Becky, happy to be here. Um, let me know if you cannot see my screen and should be up now. Looks really good, Chris, thank you. Excellent, all right. So let me get organized here. All right, so uh, as Becky said, I uh, work for the Division of Housing for the state, and I cover Chafee County among other um, regions throughout the, uh, the county or throughout the state. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about uh, affordable housing finance and then give a little more 
um, color to some of the things uh, outside of tax credits that Catherine touched on. And then also gonna focus most of my presentation on how um, state and local governments, uh, in particular us as the state and uh, local governments in your region can help um, develop affordable housing. So to start off, um, I'm just gonna give uh, a very quick uh, development finance one-on-one. -on -one. Catherine did a really good job of outlining of sources and uses and you know what it costs to build a building and what it then takes to finance that development. Um, so I'll go into that in a little bit. Then I'll focus on DOH and what we do for a while um, and also a couple of projects that we've financed in uh, case studies, some of them in conjunction with um, CHAFA and a couple also in Chaffee County itself. Um, and then I'll close with a couple um, more recent things, kind of COVID driven, um, mostly initiatives that DOH has been uh, has undertaken during this time. All right, so the uh, in affordable housing finance or any housing finance for that matter, there's a, a capital stack, which is just a, a term for um, the different types of money that go into a project. Um, so starting from the top, your biggest source generally um, is either debt or tax credit equity. So someone lends you money, a bank, for example, um, and then uh, as Catherine, I won't go into tax credits again since she did a good job explaining that. So if you get, if you receive tax credits, a syndicator provides equity or an investor provides equity, um, and that can make up a big chunk of your project also. The third main um, piece of, of most projects is money from uh, the state in our, in our area. Uh, it's from the state or from, a uh, local county or a local uh, city or municipality. Um, it's different around the country, uh, but, but in Colorado, that's generally the structure. Um, and then kind of the, the third big, big one is either uh, owner equity in the form of, of cash or in the form of a developer or deferred developer fee. Um, the deferred developer fee is a, is a very unique concept to affordable housing. And it basically allows an, an owner to defer a percentage of their profit, um, which is their developer fee, uh, to, to a later time or to when the property is already built um, in exchange for using that money up front to finance construction um, or, or, or land acquisition or any, anything really. Um, so those are the five, I haven't listed as five, but it's really, uh, I think of it kind of as, as um, yeah, really four, four pieces there. Uh, and in the bottom, you can see just a, this is actually, a, I, I took these numbers from a recent deal that was actually in Chaffee County. Um, and you can see that the, you know, there's, there's the, obviously the, the loan, tax rate equity, uh, local government support, and then the deferred developer fee. And in this case, you can see that the majority of the project is financed by tax credit equity. Um, that can be the case. It can be more closer to 50-50. It just depends on the project. Um, but that was the case here. And uh, uh, remember for the next slide that the debt is only, is, is a you know very small, it's less than 10% or a little more than 10% of the project um, relative to the overall cost. And that's kind of one of the, the main reasons why that government loan or grant has to come in, um, which I'll explain in, in a second. Um, so Catherine also touched on kind of the, you know, the financing gaps. Um, so the, the basic premise is that uh, you know, to build a building, no matter what it is, um, if it's an affordable housing uh, project or a market rate housing project, um, and you know, so you can look at also office buildings or, or retail. Like, there's a certain kind of built-in cost. It's going to be at least you know X for a building of a certain size. Um, you know, different project types cost different things. But when it comes to multifamily and housing, um, it there is really no discrepancy, no, no difference between affordable and market rate. Um, you know, this is outside of things like really nice uh, finishes inside or a pool or a fitness center, things that affordable buildings don't always have. Um, you know, the, the, the structures cost about the same to build. However, um, affordable housing um, is affordable. Uh, the rents are lower. So um, the amount of money that someone will lend you 
to build that building as a result of having lower rents and lower income uh, is, is also lower. So you've got a discrepancy that's filled in large part by tax credits and tax credit projects, um, but uh, in a non-tax credit deal or even in tax credit deals, very often the state and local government uh, steps in and provides, um, provides money to those projects. And, and that's really the only way that these projects get built and get across the finish line, in particular in rural areas um, where there are not always a lot of other uh, sources of, of funding. Um, so the state will provide X dollars, you know, the, and then um, as I'm, you can see in the, the bottom of the slide here, we have different funding sources, both state and federal, and uh, you know, the local government can also uh, pitch in some money in places like El Paso County that I cover or Denver and the colleagues covers. There are affordable housing, um, uh, there's money for affordable housing in the, in the form of funds or um, money from the federal government. Um, Chafee County does not receive money from the federal government. It is not an entitlement community. And therefore, um, you know, what they can do to help push or spur development and reduce the costs and help these projects get across the finish line is provide things like fee waivers and reductions, um, pilot, which is a payment, payment in lieu of taxes, uh, structure and um, just provide other incentives. Um, sometimes there's density incentives um, to build, uh, you know, more more square footage, more units, build higher, things like that. That can encourage developers to to build um, because it is very it's very difficult to build affordable housing, and it's even more difficult in in rural regions. So that brings us to the division of housing. Um, so that's uh, you know. The, the goal of DOH is to work with local communities um, and, and uh, help you know, basically build housing. Um, and we, we do target uh, those with the greatest, really the greatest need. Um, so we have, we, we do want to ensure and provide housing for those in um, rural areas is one of our priorities as well as um, those are the very low end of the income spectrum, whether they live in Denver or Alamosa. Um, so people who make below a certain income level. Um, and then, you know, we also do things, uh, you know, outside of just straight development finance, um, we manage uh, and, and provide vouchers for, um, for properties across the state. And uh, we, we do a lot of work in homeless housing as well, um, with farms across the state. Uh, and then recently we have begun regulating um, factory built uh, structures. So if a, if a um, modular home or a, a, um, a trailer park or a, um, you know, a mobile home comes into the state of Colorado, we regulate the construction and installation um, and, and we also have now started regulating uh, mobile home parks themselves, which I'll, I'll touch on a little later. All right, um, there's a little bit more about what we do. I won't go, I won't read all this verbatim, but uh, you, can, you can see this later on the slides. Um, so technical assistance, uh, this is things that fall in this category are, you know, conversations with developers, local leaders, et cetera. Um, in your community, um, I, I, I speak a good amount with Becky and with a couple of developers uh, from time to time. And, and so help understand what we can do to help them develop housing. Um, we do a couple of trainings and workshops throughout the year as well. Uh, uh, but, the, but the main piece of what we're doing is, um, is actually providing money through grant loan programs to uh, to developers, housing authorities, local governments, uh, for-profit and non-profit developers uh, for that matter. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get into that as well in a second. So just to, to kind of back up for a second and think about what, uh, what DOH does. Um, so our fiscal year runs from July through end of June. And in the fiscal year that ended this past July, or I guess that ended this past June, um, we, uh, I mentioned the vouchers, so we issued over 8,000 vouchers. Um, 
And the, the great majority of those serves folks who have a disability, uh, which is great. And we also, on the homeless front, um, we were part of um, financing uh, projects that had, that included 1,600 uh, beds. Um, so that was a, another, uh, it's nice. I don't do a ton of work in, the, in the, you know, either the voucher or the homeless side, but we do, some of my projects have those elements. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool to see how, uh, how much we really do impact throughout the state. Um, and, and overall, you know, outside of homeless, just, just all types of housing, um, over 5,000 uh, housing opportunities, which um, is, a, is basically um, uh, individuals uh, within units that we helped, helped finance. Um, we also do home modifications, which is I think a lesser known piece of what we do. So you're literally someone who has like, lifts in a house or an apartment and needs a modification to help them live easier. Um, we will literally go in and help, uh, we'll, we'll pay to help modify their home to make them live uh, in, a, in a more, you know, a more suitable environment for them, for them. So we did about 700 of those last year. And then uh, uh, I mentioned the manufactured home piece. So we did about 800 um, inspections of those. So when you talk about affordable housing, most of what we talk about is based on incomes. Uh, so across the top of this uh, uh, bar graph, you can see uh, the, the AMI, which is the area median income. Um, and uh, what, as Catherine mentioned earlier, you know, 60% is, is kind of the traditional cutoff for um, what's considered affordable housing. Uh, you know, that number, the federal government and, and CHAF as well, uh, now allow for income averaging, which allows you to go up to um, you know, a little higher in, in AMI, as long as your total AMI is not above 60% overall. Um, so what this graph is showing is the very top, uh, those are folks who live above the median income. So um, I don't know off the top of my head what it is in Chaffee County, but in Denver, um, the AM, AMI is in the mid 80s, or uh, it's like 80, 000, 85, I believe, 84, 86, something like that. And um, so you do math calculation to figure out what 60% uh, is. It's you know, someone in the 40s. And um, these are folks who live above the median, above that. And of those, 92% are fine. Like they are not uh, cost burdened. And, and cost burdened means you pay 30% or more of your income um, in, in rent. Um, so you, as you can see, kind of the white blue shows kind of where the need is. So as you get to the moderate income, that's usually considered like 80 to 120 or 80% above AMI. And, um, and, then, and then low income starts at 60 and below. Um, uh, very low and, and extremely low or you know, below 30% AMI. So what this basically shows is as you uh, have folks who are in lower income brackets, um, more and more of them are paying more than 30% of their AM, of their income in rent, um, which means they're cost burdened or, or extremely uh, um, severely cost burdened, which is that 62% on the very uh, bottom left there. Um, so the, the highest need for developing housing is at that level. We help develop housing in Chaffos, uh, you know, supports housing at all income levels up, uh, that are considered affordable. Um, but uh, there clearly is a need, you know, and, and that's something that we try to address uh, through how we finance uh, projects. Um, these are just a, a list of a couple of the different types of projects that we fund. Uh, so the most, I think the most basic two are the, the, the two top ones, um, you know, rehabilitation of an existing rental property or new construction, um, whether it be rental or home ownership. Uh, we also have a couple of programs, down payment assistance. We, it's just that we help pay for uh, home buyers uh, down payment who qualify um, based on income. And then single family owner occupied rehab, we, uh, we, we provide money to organizations that help um, uh, you know, rehabilitate homes and do a lot of energy efficiency upgrades and things like that to save them money. 
Uh, permanent supportive housing is another word for, it's kind of synonymous with homeless housing. Um, it's 30% AMI and below, so the, uh, the most needy and folks who uh, generally require uh, a lot of services. So these buildings are um, very expensive to run, um, provide incredible support and are really a great um, thing in our communities for, uh, for folks who need, uh, who need housing. Um, we fund homeless shelters and we also fund uh, community housing development organizations uh, in your region, the Chafee Housing Trust. They're uh, what's called a CHODO, C-H-D-O. Um, so they've received funding a couple of years to basically operate and help, um, you know, um, develop housing. Um, areas of impact. So I mentioned the vouchers, uh, mentioned our, our, I guess it might be, this slide's a little duplicative. Um, you know, basically our, our goals are to increase and preserve affordable housing. Um, I mentioned homelessness. I also mentioned uh, factory built structures array, so I won't dwell on that anymore. Okay, so getting into the meat and potatoes of it a little bit. Um, so we provide, as I mentioned, grants and loans. Um, these are for uh, affordable housing. And as I mentioned, we do do many things, but in terms of the grants and loans, we are specifically focused on here on this slide, affordable housing development. So actual development projects, uh, building buildings. Um, so our funds are considered to be gap filling. We are not the primary lender. We're not supposed to be a large percentage of your capital stack. We are intended to come in uh, and be the last, uh, the last guy in, essentially. So when we um, you know, see a project, we want to see that the project is pretty well vetted and that you just need a little bit of money extra, a little bit of extra money to get it across the finish line. Um, and I'll show some of my examples. I'll explain um, kind of how that works uh, with some of the Chafee County ones that have come in recently. Um, our applications are competitive. Uh, they are monthly, you can apply anytime, but we'll review them starting first of the month. Um, definitely recommend you talk to me or, or anyone else um, who throughout the state who is a housing development specialist um, in, in the region where a project is being built prior to applying, just so we know about it and we can kind of work with you to make sure that uh, it's, it works with our funding. Um, you know, when we underwrite, we're looking at uh, support from the community locally, whether it's financially or uh, just in, you know, support and name uh, or in writing, um, whether the market supports the project uh, and then your, your costs and, you know, feasibility, you know, is, do you have enough financing to build the project? Um, we develop, uh, um, we only fund, as I mentioned, projects at 60% AMI or below. Um, we do want to see also a, a percentage, uh, at least 5% of units at 30% AMI if possible. Um, and then anyone can, really anyone can apply. Um, the, the, the only major distinction is that you have uh, between a grant and a loan is that if you're a nonprofit or a local government or housing authority, um, you get a, you qualify for a grant and, uh, you know, the other category is, uh, is your for-profit developers, um, and they qualify for loans um, since they have the, their structure is a little bit different. And these are just the names and acronyms for our different programs. Uh, HGG is our state, uh, one of our, our biggest state source. HSP is homeless uh, um, uh, funds uh, permanent supportive housing or, or supportive housing projects, which is homeless housing. Um, CHIF is a low interest loan fund that we have for uh, usually construction to perm, um, permanent uh, loan for projects. Um, housing Development Loan Fund is another, another one we have that's not, uh, not used very often, but we do use it. And then on the federal side, uh, home is a very big source uh, from we get every year. Uh, like I said, some municipalities also get home funds like El Paso County and same with CDBG. And those are used, um, usually uh, they, they, they can't, CDBG cannot be used in certain regions 
if you already receive funding from them. Um, both those types of funding can be used in Chaffee County though. And I've actually, yeah, I think the two projects I'm gonna bring up in a second, um, I've used, that's, I used see at home for one and CDBG for the other. So those are good, good sources. Uh, Housing Trust Fund, um, another good source. Journal works better in cities, but, uh, but it, it, it can work um, in rural locations as well. And then the neighborhood stabilization program, this is disaster recovery. So uh, in the flooding or uh, wildfires, that, that money comes out of NSP. And that's kind of a separate, whole separate pot. Someone, uh, another person who's not a housing development specialist runs that program since so it's pretty, pretty big. And these are our regions. Um, so, uh, yeah, these are pretty up to date. Um, I no longer cover sort of the east part of the state, but I still cover everything up and down the Arkansas River. Um, and then uh, over in El Paso County and, and, and Douglas uh, are the big ones. And uh, the other folks, um, all around me there, I cover other regions in throughout the state. So I'm gonna talk about some case studies now. Uh, this first one, um, this is the first project I ever wrote actually. Uh, I started at DOH in early 2019. And um, first project that came to me and it's the only one like this I've seen since. Um, and the reason I put it on here is because it's a really good example of uh, a, a rural project that was very creative and, and very, very gregarious, I should say, in, in uh, getting funds from various um, sources to finance a project that has no, could not support any, any debt. They couldn't, they couldn't get a loan because their income wasn't high enough or that they were spitting off the project. So um, basically they came to us and uh, the woman who runs this housing authority had, and this is uh, uh, east of Carl Springs um, and, and Callahan. Uh, what she did is went and got a bunch of grants from El Paso County. Um, she also had a, a couple of local organizations provided literally like $1,000 here, $10,000 there. Um, and it was about a million dollar project and we funded half of it. Um, um, you know, had they come to us looking for, for a, a, a half of $500,000 and they technically qualified for it and hadn't looked for anything else um, and hadn't didn't, and had opportunities to use other money, um, we would have encouraged them to, to try to also, uh, you know, leverage money from El Paso County or, um, you know, if, if they had access to if they were on the edge of Coral Springs and Coral Springs is a city and things like that. But um, this just goes to show you that you, know, you don't need, um, you know, it's very doable to do rehab projects in rural areas with not, um, uh, you know, without a ton of money uh, from, from the state. Um, and you don't need to, you know, get a huge loan and all this and that that you generally see in projects. Um, so I guess this one's pretty unique, but it's, uh, I think, a kind of a cool, cool little example. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, this is more of a conventional project in Douglas County. Um, I underwrote this one earlier this year, this summer, and uh, it's a new um, affordable uh, seniors building. And this is a more of a traditional capital stack. You've got 9% tax credits, a first trust loan, a subordinate loan, um, and then we provided money in the form of a, a home grant and then they also received, um, uh, you know, they already owned the land. So the land was contributed into the project. So that was effectively, you know, free for them. Um, and uh, the town provided some money. So this is how you, this is the structure that's probably most used or similar to this for new construction. Um, so, you know, in, in polar opposite to the last one, uh, this is a, a fairly conventional deal. This one, some of you may recognize, um, Slider Ridge is uh, Commonwealth um, was or is the developer of this project. They um, are going to be uh, starting work on it pretty soon. I believe we're in contracting with them currently. 
but it's uh, 40 units. It's also actually a fairly conventional deal. They use 9% Litex or uh, 9% Litex, um, and, and then, and then uh, Chaffa also actually provided both the um, conventional first trust and the uh, subordinate uh, second loan in the second position on this one. Um, and we provided, you know, again, uh, money in the form of a grant. And this was CDBG. Um, and, and the other piece here that I think is worth pointing out is that um, Salida offered various zoning incentives that uh, helped allow for this project um, to, uh, to move forward and save the project money. And all those things help. So, you know, for when it comes to um, I've found that most places in Colorado are fairly, um, you know, they understand what it takes to, or that it's difficult to build affordable housing and they're willing to incentivize it. And those are things that, um, you know, I think are very important. And as, you know, speaking for DOH, we think are also very important in, um, in pushing development forward. Uh, oh, and then also it's the, the first housing project, affordable project in Salida in 23 years. Um, I know um, Collegiate Commons up the, up the road in uh, BV was uh, four, maybe, years ago, three, four years ago, it, it uh, delivered. Um, but yeah, there aren't, there aren't a whole lot of new construction projects in, in the area. So this is a great example of a um, cool project coming up. Uh, Lazy K. So this one I did not underwrite, but this is... Um, a product in Gunnison, and it's got both uh, go, both uh, affordable home ownership, which home ownership for us is 80% AMI as opposed to 60 for rental, and then it's uh, it has market rate as well, 120% AMI units. And um, this project I, I put here in here because um, you know, there's a couple things that can be done to really lower the cost of housing. And one of them is, is, is getting your land for free. Um, so this has donated land. I don't know what the, the value of that was, but let's say $200,000 to $600,000. Um, that, that's a lot of money when it comes to a project of this size. Um, we gave them over just over $1.2 million. And uh, that's, that paid for kind of the, some of the infrastructure up front and also tap fees took into... Um, uh, city utilities. And then uh, the city also provided money, the uh, city of Gunnison, but they also provided, um, uh, they, they waived some of the fees. So that helps uh, a good amount. Um, and then the, the local housing fund in, in Gunnison also pitched some money. So it's got a lot of sources here. And, um, you know, there isn't a, uh, you know, again, a traditional loan. It's, it's, they were able to make it work um, through this, this structure. Uh, and there's also a, a park and early childhood um, education center that's going to be here. I think this one is also in contracting currently. Uh, River Ridge, this um, is another local project for, for Chafee County. The Chafee Housing Trust um, is, is working on it. And uh, it's very similar to the other project that Reed did down in Salida. Um, I always mess up the name, uh, Two Rivers, I believe is what he calls it now. Um, um, and that project, I think, was also eight, six or eight units. Um, I, it was before my time, but this one, he's using, again, uh, um, it is um, uh, modular housing from um, this time around. He's going to be using the uh, Indie Dwell folks out of Pueblo. Um, the, and then he's going to be uh, building eight units, 80% uh, AMI again for home ownership. And for this one, he got a Colorado Housing Finance or Colorado Housing Foundation, or sorry, Colorado Health Foundation uh, grant to finance his land acquisition. He received a grant from us, and then the city uh, you know, discounted some of the fees. So um, by the time he starts selling these project proper these projects, he's able to use these units. He's able to use the money to pay back his loan and doesn't have to. Or, excuse me to um, um, to uh, 
needs to pay back his construction loan and you know, he doesn't need a permanent loan on this one because it's not a, a rental project. It's a, a homeownership project that he will own the ground below the units, not the units themselves. Um, so it's, it's, I think this is kind of cool. You know, uh, there's a, uh, the housing trust I think has been um, a nice addition and, and recently that now has been able to start developing uh, projects. Um, so we're happy to support them as, a, as both a, a community housing development organization or CHODO as I mentioned earlier and individually throughout some of these projects. I think this is, I'm almost done, yeah, I'm almost done with these um, uh, case studies. Uh, so I mentioned we've financed some programs. So the Upper Arkansas Cog uh, down in, in, uh, in Canyon City, um, we provide them money uh, pretty much annually to, to administer a home rehabilitation program. Um, we provide funds for them to administer the program. And then there's a revolving loan fund that they draw from that's been established previously that they can use money uh, to actually do the, the construction and rehabilitation of homes. Um, so, uh, and we have this all across the state. So we've got probably 10 plus SFO programs um, specifically for this purpose. And finally, uh, this is a project uh, in Montrose, um, homeless project. And they also have um, uh, vouchers. There's also vouchers in this project as well. They, it's, it's for homeless youth um, is, the, uh, is the target uh, population. Uh, we provided them a grant from our Homeless Solutions Program Fund. Um, they received some you know, local money from foundations and, and donors and got some fees waived. And uh, they, they, get, they receive services that are funded through um, uh, you know, some of it they fund themselves and then some uh, through um, they fundraise for and other, other grants and such. Uh, and this is a total of, of eight units down in, the, in Montrose. So that's the end of the case studies. Uh, I'll just finish by talking quickly about some of the new initiatives that DOH has being the Mobile Home Park Oversight uh, uh, Act. So we now, um, you have to register in mobile home parks um, as of uh, February of this year. And so we're, we're responsible for to kind of overseeing that. There's a whole other group that, that does that, um, that I'm, I'm not really involved with it and accept when they overlap into some of my communities. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch, we find some projects in Fremont County that are uh, mobile home, uh, home home parks. And, um, but since, you know, these are all across the state, this is, I think this is pertinent to most communities um, since, uh, you know, the goal is to basically try to uh, create a, a better and safer and, um, really healthier environment um, and then make sure that, uh, you know, any disputes between landlords and, uh, and tenants um, or the you know, folks who owned, own the, um, the uh, mobile homes that are placed on, on concrete pads are, uh, you know, everyone's being treated fairly and, and um, you know, there's running water, there's electricity, things like that. So we've gotten, you can see in the right a little bit about our, uh, We've had a lot of people, uh, this is out of date a little bit, but we've had a lot of people register. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of calls about complaints. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good thing overall that, that we're looking at this and that hopefully, um, yeah, creates a better situation for everybody. And finally, COVID. So we've had quite a bit of money come from the state legislature specifically for COVID. Um, and uh, you know, the, the bottom um, part kind of speaks to it. Those are just different funds and different amounts that we received that do many different things. Um, rental assistance is, is the main thing. Uh, you can see rental mortgage assistance uh, for 70 and 1410 there on the bottom left. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've been, we've been 
we've contracted with a lot of organizations across the state to help those who are unable to pay their rent due to losing their job for COVID, for example. Um, so that's uh, that's something you know, obviously more recent, but that we'll be continuing to do um, uh, as long as the legislature tasks us with it and provides uh, provides funding to uh, administer these programs. That I think right now uh, sunset at the end of this uh, calendar year. I think that is it. Yep. Uh, any questions? You can obviously ask us now, I believe, but um, that's my email address, Chris Furlong at state.co.us. Um, you can call that phone number. That is my office line. It does uh, it, it does forward to my email, so I will get your voicemail. Um, I don't have a, a work cell phone, so I am stuck with this one still. Uh, and that's it. I'll turn it back over uh, to Becky. Thank you, Chris. That was a fantastic presentation. You and Catherine have definitely done a good job of outlining the complexities surrounding how affordable housing is financed um, here in Colorado. Um, I do have some questions in queue. And so I'd like to invite back to the conversation, uh, Catherine, and invite Jeff Owsley, our community relationship manager from Chaffa as well into the conversation. Um, the first question is directed at Catherine. You had mentioned that the 9% tax credits, which contribute a bit more to the equity in a project, are very competitive. Um, what can local governments and local community do to make those applications more competitive? That is such a great question. And, um, you know, I think this echoes similar to what DOH, what Chris said, you know, Chaffa really looks at um, many different factors to determine an award. Uh, a big factor is financial feasibility, local contribution, strength of development team, market track record, um, sort of affordability goals within a project. So what we've seen in the past as success, and I guess in smaller communities, so I'll speak to more what I would imagine, JP County, um, sometimes attracting a qualified developer who could really bring forth a qualified project matters. And I know in the case of Salida Ridge, um, some of the work that the city of Salida did in order to um, codify in the land use codes, the idea that uh, certain metrics were important in their um, housing inventory is somewhat of the story of how um, Commonwealth was attracted to that piece of land and became involved and then put forth a tax credit application. So, you know, there really is that as a kernel of the background in that project. Um, I think I've seen other communities, it really matters um, entitlement certainty. So if there's any way to do fast tracking or provide mm. um, the ability to um, remove any of that unknown or risk-based process, that can matter quite a bit in affordable housing, both tax credit and smaller. Um, I think having community support, so whether that starts at the elected level or the professional staff within communities, that really often matters um, because the development can, community will sometimes respond to what, um, you know, what the messaging is coming out of um, the needs from the elected body. Uh, and then I also think um, coalition building is very, very important. Um, I've seen many projects where you have a great idea and a great team behind it, and maybe it's not well received in a community or a neighborhood. So really helping to develop those coalitions, have those conversations early and frequent so that um, decisions are getting made with a responsive touch to what is needed in the community and a broad dialogue. And I don't know if there's any other secret sauce. It's really a complicated industry. And so, you know, each project is unique. You know, there isn't, um, I wouldn't say anything is standard. Affordable housing is a complex environment, huge challenge in capital stack, development financing longer term, often development timeline, so therefore more risk. And so often you don't have as many uh, developers interested in that process. So it, that's part of why, um, any success needs to be celebrated because they really have overcome a lot of obstacles. And I'll let, you know, Chris, if you have other. 
Thank you. I, I really appreciate that um, that last comment that we need to celebrate all of the small successes that we have because this is really, um, it's an elephant that we're eating. So each bite we need to savor for sure. Um, my next question is for Jeff. And I'm wondering, Jeff, um, you know, the SHIP program is intended for kind of smaller communities. I'm wondering if you could give us a sneak peek or a little bit of a preview of what we might expect from that program. Sure, we're really excited about that program because of just what Catherine had mentioned, you know, it's hard to attract developers and, and especially when you get down to the smaller projects, which is what most smaller communities are looking at. Um, they, you know, we're not going to have too many 48 unit confluent park pro, uh, projects that come up. Mm -hmm. um, but along the Arkansas, all the way along there, there's going to be some smaller communities where uh, one thing that uh, Chris mentioned that can really help is uh, the donation of land or, you know, there's there's different things that can help. But the issue is that on those small projects, you're not attracting a developer that just drives the show. That's one thing. And uh, so you've got either a, a municipality or a nonprofit or a mom and pop type thing where they've got a piece of ground that they want to develop into some housing. Or, you know, you just have people who have not been involved in developing housing. If you've got Reed um, helping you, that's, that's a big benefit. You know, Reed has done this. But but anyway, one of the key things that we're developing into this SHIP project is technical assistance that is directed toward helping um, those people who don't normally do housing projects. So that developer's guide that Catherine mentioned is, is part of this continuum of technical assistance that we're uh, putting together. Another one is that uh, a colleague of Chris's, Andrew Atchley and I are putting together um, many of you may have taken the developer's toolkit that, that DOH has, mm -hmm. and um, this would be a rural developer's toolkit that will not, uh, you know, use the tax credit program as a basis for putting together your capital stack because these smaller projects aren't going to attract or uh, work with the uh, tax credit program per se for the most part. And so you're looking at a whole different ball game. And um, and then with the the being able to uh, work on the development side yourself instead of just getting a developer, so it's it's a different ball game, and so that's why we're doing a, a de rural developers toolkit. Then there's also going to be a person. What we found, we we interviewed lots of programs around the country actually, and found that the most successful have somebody who can really guide projects. Um, and uh, what we're calling it, you might call it a shepherd, you know, that's one way to put it, but we're calling it a Sherpa because we're in Colorado and <laughs> we like that term better. <laughs> and so anyway, we're going through a uh, process right now uh, to find, uh, we're uh, doing an RFP to uh, determine who uh, or what entity is going to provide that consulting. And so that'll be part of that continuum as well. On the financial side, uh, we're looking at uh, different options to help uh, with um, uh, working with banks with uh, a, a credit uh, where, where we put in a deposit into a bank and it helps to uh, helps the local banks to be able to, to finance these kinds of projects better and some other funding options. So that's what we're working on as well. So uh, we're really hoping that this together will provide opportunities for these smaller uh, projects and to come forward uh, throughout the state. But we're kind of focusing on this side of the state first on that. Thank you, Jeff. That's really exciting. It's um, exactly the kind of thing I think that small communities that are trying to eat this elephant, to, to keep using that phrase, um, can tap into. So thank you for that explanation. I appreciate it. And I look forward to participating in some of that. Um, Chris, I'm wondering if you might describe, well, let me back up and say, you, some of you may not know this, 
But um, last week, Chafee County celebrated the creation of a multi-jurisdictional housing authority. So the Chafee Housing Authority is launching. And I'm wondering, Chris, if you might um, just speak to the role that housing authorities can play in affordable housing finance. And I know it's many. Um, so maybe if you would just mind hitting a couple of, of, of highlights of where you see some best practices, that'd be great. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so I deal with a couple housing authorities. Um, the, the main one has been in uh, Paso County. Uh, they're, they've got a housing authority as well as uh, uh, Coral Springs. And uh, yeah, the roles they play are, are varied. Um, where I'm from on the East Coast, generally housing authorities do not develop. They are really managers uh, and asset managers of existing um, you know, legacy uh, public housing for the most part. And so it's really, it's not the, the, the same role they have there is not what they have here. So it was kind of cool when I moved here to see that, you know, there's all these publicly kind of minded development groups um, in various parts of the state. So it's exciting that you guys have, have started one. I'm excited to, to work with you guys in the future. Um, but what I've seen is, you know, they essentially function very much like other developers. Um, you know, the advantage is that, that they, they are, they do qualify for grants, for example, from us, from speaking strictly from DOH's perspective, um, as opposed to having to partner with another organization and um, to help, help push a, a project, for example. And the other thing that they do is they provide uh, a tax benefit by um, uh, in many places, if you are a housing authority, you can be what's called a special limited partner in a project. Um, and so tax credit partnerships have this fairly complicated um, organizational structure with general partners, limited partners, um, and then different percentages of, of, ownership, of ownership of that project. Um, because of the, the tax credit piece of it. And um, in, in, whether it's in that scenario or just an annual project, you can effectively not pay, um, pay uh, your property taxes there. You, you don't pay them for a period of time and you receive a tax exemption. And, and that can be huge in, in a, you know, the, the amount, if you're paying, um, you know, in some places, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, or whatever it is in, in taxes, uh, you, the way a loan, loan prices are calculated is based on your income minus your expenses. So you're losing a bunch of expenses and so you can get a higher loan. Um, so that's, that's always, you know, I think a, a pretty nice boon for developers. Um, they generally pay a little bit of money to the, housing authority in exchange for that benefit sometimes. Um, so that can be a revenue stream for the housing authority, which is a positive for you guys. Um, but you know, in terms of, of really helping to uh, push forward the goal of developing affordable housing in your community, that's the way that you can, you can help without really doing a whole lot in all honesty. Uh, I mean, you're, you're not shouldering the burden of developing the project yourself. You're helping them reduce their costs and make the project more affordable. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it's, I think the, the, the role the housing authority can also play, like Douglas County, like they do quite a bit of development in Douglas County. Some housing authorities are, you know, some of the main developers, even Denver, Denver Housing Authority, like they're one of the biggest developers, if not the biggest in the city and county of Denver. Um, so it's really about capacity building, I think, and having, uh, you know, instead of Chafee County having to rely on, um, you know, it's, uh, out of state developers to come in and do projects or out of county developers to come in, you can have that capacity yourself um, if you're able to, to develop it and you know, hire folks who have development experience and, and whatnot. So I think it's, I think it's great. I, I don't think it is necessary everywhere, um, but it's, uh, it's something that if the community is behind it, I think can be a really, uh, really positive um, force for, for welding. That's great. Thank you. That was a lot of examples on how housing authority <laughs> help make a project more affordable. No, it is. There's a lot of, you know, they can operate the vouchers on the, on the operating and asset management. And there's 
so many things that can be Yeah, done. vouchers. I didn't mention vouchers also. That's another, yeah, that's a, another, that. another piece. I can um, one more to add, actually. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and one thing I have seen in my career, I've worked in Colorado 20 years, is that often in smaller areas, you might have somebody attracted to come and build it, but they don't want to stay and manage it for the next 20 years. And so that's a great role if it makes sense with the capacity of the housing authority to perform that role because it needs to be operated with that public benefit. It can be um, an asset building uh, exercise for a housing authority, but it really can be one of those puzzle pieces where you might be able to get the thing built, but how do you really successfully operate that? That's the true lifeblood of this work. Wow, thank you for adding that, Catherine. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I have a couple of questions about bonds. Um, I, I will preface it by saying in Chafee County, we now have issuing authority of about 1,063,000 in private activity bonds. Um, in addition to that, um, one of our, our viewers um, asked a question on uh, how often do you see municipal bonding efforts play into the capital stack? So I'm wondering, um, and this goes out to any of you, Catherine, um, I know you probably play in this field a little bit more often, but how do bonds, including private activity bonds and municipal bonds, play into the capital stack for these kind of developments? Um, so I'll preface by saying I'm not an expert on bond financing because that's a team of attorneys that cost a lot of money. But um, I'm going to separate it into two things, which first are private activity bonds and then other bonds, um, tax exempt and also um, taxable. The private activity bond resource um, can really make a difference, but um, in my career doing any kind of bond financed affordable housing rental project is very challenging in smaller communities. It's hard to um, get to the deeper rents that sometimes are needed in rural markets using a bond financed project. And uh, some of the things that work counter to that sometimes can be the size of the project that's needed to cover the costs. So, um, if you can imagine an average bond finance deal might be something like 75 plus units, even more toward 100 units. That's a very big impact and really hard to absorb in a smaller community. So it can be, it, it, it can be hard. We do see in smaller areas of Colorado, the resource with the state credit combined with 4% federal credits which are bond financed, making a difference. Um, so I, I do see those working. Um, in, in some of the smaller communities. So the private activity bond resources is excellent. I'm glad you know, to talk about it. Um, one of the bigger things to understand too, though, is that it's a resource not only for Chapey County, but it's also a resource for the state of Colorado because if we can offset some of um, the demands that we see in other markets, it frees up uh, other resources that can play in more rural spaces. So it's, it's a, it's a local conversation as well as a statewide conversation with that resource, and it's complicated. Um, and then just the other side of that in terms of other bond financed um, uh, products within capital stacks, I haven't seen it a whole lot. Housing authorities have the authority to issue bonds, municipalities do, um, but it, it often, um, the only place I've seen it happen honestly is in Denver where they issued um, quite a lot of bonds and in short term are able to carry those costs and then they're deploying them into a variety of, uh, of projects that have been um, in their pipeline within the city of Denver. Their player is the Denver Housing Authority. So I, I haven't seen it that common in smaller communities. Um, it's not to say that it can't be and our housing pressures are growing more and more but it's just a complicated financing vehicle. And I would love to be involved in something that, that might bring that to fruition, but I don't have a lot of um, uh, examples that I could offer. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate you underscoring the, the complexities of it. Um, it. The private activity bonds are relatively new to Chafee County and, um, and they're not free money. <laughs> I, think, I think that's kind of the biggest message that I was trying to get out is that they're a tool that is as part of the statewide conversation, like you said, um, but it doesn't mean that we have a million plus every year to build houses with. So um, I'm they apply PIBs well. So it's something to really be strategic with. If they can't be deployed this time, maybe think about a, 
you can um, transfer them and then maybe later on that comes back, but then we don't lose the resource statewide. That's right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Just to add on to that a little bit. Um, so I've most of the bond deals I've seen have been in, in like Colorado Springs, you know, where they large scale 4% tax credit projects that pair with bonds and those work really well. Um, I, I have seen, you know, this, I guess the smallest place where I've seen them um, myself is under a project in, in Montrose this year. Uh, and, and I know that, that Andrew, my counterpart, um, who's in, uh, who covers um, Southeast and or Southwest and then uh, and Jen on the Western Slope have done some, um, some process, have, have underwritten some projects that have, have bonds. Um, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't see them. They're generally not the, the driving force the way they can be in, in some urban areas to echo what Catherine said. Um, um, I, I think the, you know, from Chafee County's perspective um, and, and thinking about this, the Montrose one that I did, the, both the city and county had like a hundred, a million dollars in bond cap that they returned to Chaffa because they didn't want to be the issuer mm -hmm. due to the, just, it, it's, there is a capacity uh, uh, thing to, to think about. And, you know, it's, it's not no work to be issuing bonds. So <laughs> it's more important to have someone do it who does it right. And you're not, you're not necessarily lose, you're not really necessarily losing them. Um, like you said, it's not, it's not money. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's like it increases lending capacity effectively. Um, so what Montrose did is they gave them a chaffa with an indication that they wanted to use them for this specific project. So therefore, when they came to the state, they asked for additional bond cap, and we gave them, you know, their overall bond cap request was, was let's say, ten million. Uh, they had two and a half from Montrose combined, and so we gave them the difference for seven and a half. Um, so why that's great is because it actually used up the bond cap that Montrose had. It reduced the amount that we had to use, and therefore allowed us to use bond cap to do other projects throughout the states that are that um you know whether they be rural or, or, or urban communities so i think it's like i said i think it's a great tool um it doesn't always work it's definitely a more complicated uh it has an additional layer of complexity to an already complex tax credit project um but that's how they that's how you have to do it to make them work and very good chris in that one too it was the competitive credit because they received state credit so yeah it's a risky base thing. That's right, yeah. Very good, thank you. So in, um, in some of Chris's case studies, he mentioned land was part of the contribution that local governments made. The Lazy K housing in Gunnison um, included a park and an early childhood center. This is all very exciting and something we're talking about in Chafee as well. Um, that land contribution, I'm sure, can come from a variety of, of um, places. In Salida, we have an inclusionary housing ordinance that likely was the impetus for the Salida Ridge project. Um, I'm wondering if you all have input into inclusionary ordinances and their um, AMI goals, and if you have um, opinions or input, if you'd be willing to share. Ooh, um... So are you, are you referring to uh, inputs as in, do we support or not support them? Or have we you know, been proactive in trying to get them passed in Salida, for example? Yeah, I think more like, um, do you see inclusionary ordinances playing a role positively in affordable housing development? Um, so there's probably two answers here. Uh, I, it's hard for me to speak for, for DOH overall. Um, I, th I think yes, is the, the overall answer would be yes. I think we do. Um, you know, it, it provides an incentive to develop affordable housing and, and we want to provide affordable housing. Um, you know, that being said, it's, it doesn't always work everywhere. Um, I was introduced uh, to inclusionary zoning in uh, DC when we decided, as or DC decided to um, push that forward in 
what was it, uh, 2012 or so. Um, and it was uh, frankly a disaster because th the incentives were great, but in a place like DC where you're very uh, high constraints, like we have, you can't build above basically 10 stories um, in the district. You, uh, you know, offering bonus density to developers in exchange for greater affordability was not always something that happened or they, it couldn't happen because you know, it's a bunch of row homes or there, there's just as much, everything's developed. Every inch of DC basically there's a road that has buildings on it and parks. So um, if, if you, I think that's a unique example um, because and, and the city just didn't really think it through to start with. Um, you know, I don't know overall how, uh, uh, clearly there is land, but I know that land versus buildable land versus appropriately zoned land are all very different things. So I think inclusion zoning is, is works really well when the incentives can be realized and then you can actually provide bonus density to developers, um, which, which is, which is the case with what happened with Slider Ridge, um, as far as I can tell. And, and from, mm -hmm. uh, from, yeah, all those companies that have with, with Commonwealth, they spoke very highly of their, um, you know, working with the town or with the city. So yeah, it's, again, I think it's a case by case basis. Um, I, I think ideologically as a tool, it is fantastic uh, as a proponent of affordable housing myself, um, but it just has to be considered with the economic, I think, ramifications that can accompany it if there are not, if there's not the ability to appropriately compensate developers for what effectively is you know, a lowering of the value of their property, um, um, which is, I think has to be kept in mind. And then therefore, you know, can't get a loan that's high enough, they can't develop a project, then you get no housing. So, but that's just my, most of that's my personal two cents. So <laughs> take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Oh, I have one more broad question for the group and then we can um, sign off a little bit early and get a, a half hour or so of our day back. But if you could um, offer some advice to a community, what, what would you say um, were the biggest kind of pitfalls or blunders that um, local government and uh, housing authority and community advocacy organizations could make? as they're navigating this? Where, what are the things we should avoid doing? I think um, it's hard to answer that, Becky, from my standpoint. Um, I really, um, I live in a small community myself. I live on the Western Slope. I'm a Colorado native um, in my work uh, with Chaffa and also with Dola. I've been in lots of small towns. Um, and it, it just is such a unique answer in all of the contexts that um, I would be prepared for the long haul. I'd be prepared to be committed. I think political will is essential. Um, and I think having core entity, whether it's the housing authority, a nonprofit, a for-profit, a, a community group, but you need a core championship group because to see it through over multiple years takes time, but it matters in our smaller communities because we want to keep them viable and um, the pressures on them are growing. You know, the VRBO world prior to COVID, the, um, all of that stress is coming and has been impacting us. Um, I would uh, try to combine both the planning, zoning, municipal type tools with um, financing options. Uh, we've seen a lot of really great commitment from our state legislature toward actually funding housing. Now COVID has derailed some of that, but it's um, on the horizon, hopefully. And so those opportunities are going to be there. So if you can be shovel ready to take advantage when those come, uh, you know, that's another opportunity there. So it's, we're all there trying to work on these solutions um, but there's no silver bullet or easy answer. So it's about more that commitment and fortitude because it does matter. It really matters for our residents and um, the viability of our whole state. Great, thank you. 
Does anyone else want to jump in on that? I like how, uh, Catherine, you kind of switched it to what we should do. That's probably a more positive way to answer that or to ask that question. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on that? Like any uh, bits of advice for Chafee County as we start navigating um, these, these kind of large funding waters? Yeah, yeah, I would echo a lot of what Catherine said. Um, and I was also going to answer it more as like things you, you should do. Um, you know, the, the pitfalls are basically not doing those things, um, but you don't hear about a lot of them because if there is not political will, uh, the product never happens. So, um, yeah, I, I think that the, you know, thinking about Chaffee County in particular, um, you know, yeah, number one, what Catherine said about the, having a coalition, um, just having advocates, you know, I, I have two or three folks, yourself included, Becky, who um, I would consider probably the biggest proponents of affordable housing that I have communication with on a fairly regular basis. And um, yeah, if there's no one pushing it, no one wants to, and then no one, you know, kind of spearheading it, then it's not going to happen. And um you know, housing authority doesn't happen unless you get together with folks in your community and talk about it and brainstorm and talk to other communities and then decide to finally do it and ask me if I think it's a good idea months ago or, or last year. And yeah, so I, I think those, that is number one. Um, and, and I think that, that, you know, political will is huge too. Um, there's a, a, a one mountain community that I cover, um, that's sort of close to you guys that has a very big divide between their county and their city. Um, and with that, they can't get a whole lot done. Um, so having, getting people on the same page and if it's possible is, is very important. Um, especially, you know, a lot of times the, 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 the uh, municipalities themselves are involved in these projects um, because DOH uh, you know, grants some funds, types of funding only to uh, municipalities. So at Salida Ridge, actually, we gave money to the city of Salida, technically, not to Commonwealth, and they are lending it to the tax credit partnership that Commonwealth owns. Um, so if you, you know, if, if they were on board, it's harder to fund them. Um, so that's super important. And then just the, I think the funding piece, you know, it doesn't, you know, I am well aware, and, and I think most of us are well aware that uh, most rural communities don't have, um, you know, they, they don't have funding to offer uh, in terms of, of, of um, housing trust funds. You know, it's not Denver and it's not Coast Springs and it's not Boulder and um, it's, not, it's not the front range really. Um, and I, I think there are, I know there are a couple, um, I just don't work with them in, uh, uh, you know, going west. But what you can do is very important. Um, you know, Poncha Springs, you know, they've, I know they've done a lot in loosening their zoning and providing various incentives to developers. And first time I went down there, I was like, wow, this is really progressive for a very small community. Um, it's not often that I think you see that all the time. And in Salida, like they they routinely knock off uh, uh, tap fees or, or permit fees, things of that nature. Um, it's, you know, it's community $40,000, but, uh, you know, every little bit counts. And when it's a $5 million project, every little bit counts even more. Um, um, and from our perspective, we just want to see that the community supports it. And, and even in that type of in-kind financial support, uh, I think that's very important. And, and um, yeah, so those, those are my three big things that I think are important but there's there are many more that's great thank you chris uh jeff did you have something to add to that oh just real quickly uh just the the fact that not doing anything is a big faux pas <laughs> and um you know not taking it seriously and realizing that um it is a huge issue all over even in even in real real small towns um uh and so Taking, taking steps that, like Catherine mentioned, it's a process that goes over a long period of time. And so if you're not moving forward in that, and uh, then you're not going to be able to take really advantage of what's coming down the pipe and, you know, do a housing needs assessment or, you know, something to, to help you understand what the situation is. A lot of times we just know 
in our minds that there's a there's an issue with housing or or we may not think about that we might be more focused on other on other issues but if you do a housing needs assessment it shows you numbers of what you need in your area and that helps you to make an action plan in order to start working towards that so that's one positive step you could take that's great thank you i appreciate it well, I'm going to um, close out then this session by just offering my gratitude for your time and for the work that you do for Colorado as a whole and for um, your contributions to this conversation here in Chafee County. I really appreciate all of you, Chris and Catherine and Jeff. Um, you've done a lot to educate me since I've been here. And I just very much look forward to continuing these conversations slowly, steadily, improving the housing affordability in Chafee County. Thank you on behalf of all of Chafee County for your time and your expertise today. And Becky, congratulations on your formation of a multi-jurisdictional housing authority. That is wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Chafee County's done a lot of work for that. So um, we, we are excited to celebrate, but we also recognize that the work is just beginning. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, thanks for feeding the conversation. And until we see each other again, um, I wish you all well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.